candy in the air and when they come down, everything's great. When they're way up there and you're reaching for it and hoping for it, they don't come down, it's frustrating. When the hex hatch gets started up there, you know, somebody's fishing this out of my boat the entire day. Um, it's caught a lot of big fish even before the hatch, so uh, it's been pretty reliable for me. So if you guys are ready, we can crank one out. So what you'll need to do, you should have a detached body pin. And it looks kind of something like this. So the pin that I'm using is an old school one, but basically yours is a little bit straighter. So what I would do is kind of canter it a little bit so that on this distal end furthest from your vise, it kind of has a little bit of an upward trajectory to it. Because you're going to be building from here, going towards your vise, less chance of the material slipping off the end if it has a little bit of a up angle. And then what I'm going to do is I'm using a six aught thread. I wouldn't use eight aught typically for me if I'm using something that fine. It's slicing through the foam too easy. Three aught's probably going to be a little bit too bulky, but. Uh, I'm just using yellow uni thread, six aught, right at the end of your pin, and just do half a dozen turns towards your vise. Then keep your slack, don't cut that. So you guys see how you have like a little spring mechanism on the other end? Tuck your thread into that and just leave it. So it should look like that. I cut mine at home beforehand this is the best tip i can give you especially if you start tying this for brown drakes and isos is to use a paper cutter to trim to cut your foam um, you can only get it so thin with scissors right because of the thickness of the blade cut that in kind of a taper like so you can kind of see how it starts thin and gets a little bit wider towards my fingers and what that'll do is is we build this body it'll add some taper into your fly. You could do a straight cut. And trust me when I say probably cut it a little bit smaller than you think you need. And you're just gonna kind of put that right on your pin. So it has two sides to it. Isos tend to love to hatch heavy in that kind of a condition. Um, you know, and I've had some of my best like daytime dry fly fishing in that situation where you're borderline freezing. The majority of my trout fishing, um, typically sometime between the 25th and 5th of June, I'll start seeing them hatch. It just depends on the year. But you're fishing the hatch. You're not fishing like a, or a spinner fall or... Yeah, I mean, I, that's part of it, right? So I'm looking for the hatch because that's typically dribbling off during the daytime. And you don't need to see a lot of bugs to have fish respond to your offering. You know, on a bright, sunny, cool to warm day, you're probably not going to see as many bugs, but just have confidence that the fish are looking for them. What you'll want to do is just kind of match these pieces up. So look at the skinniest portion. And if you got one piece that's slightly larger than the other, line it up to where they're pretty even. If you have a lot of excess, just snip it off. What you'll want to do now is just kind of take both pieces at the same time. And you're just going to split split them right on to that pin. Now I'm just going to take my off hand and apply a little side pressure. What I don't want to let go is I start wrapping my first wrap or two because they'll just spin on you. So kind of come around and it's okay if you have like a lot of excess. You can see how much extra I have here on my first turn. There's probably a good eighth of an inch, maybe more of foam. It's not a big deal. But my first wrap's going to be kind of loose, and then I'm just going to put gentle down pressure with the bob bobbin, right? And I'm going to come back in, and I'm just going to kind of roll it with my fingers one more time. And then I'm going to come back through with maybe four or five more turns of thread. So it should be on there fairly secure. first two segments are always like to me the most critical because if you can get it on that pin 
then the rest of the fly will look right when you're done. Otherwise, you'll get some weird curvature in the foam. You might miss a thread wrap here and there. But do the best you can. You know, this is a fairly large fly, right? You can go a little smaller on some of your smaller patterns, but for the hex, you want to make sure you got the longest hair you can find. So for the quantity, you don't need like a pencil thickness, but I would probably try and get 20-ish fibers of the longest hair that you have on there. You're gonna have some that will brush out because they're just too short. Go ahead and cut a chunk. You can kind of see here, it's not super dense, but not real like somewhere in between. A little bit more than the lead of a pencil, how about that? And then I would grab the longest tips with your left hand and just pull out that under fur with your other hand. Kind of try and get all that junk out of there. And you should be left with the majority of the hairs being the longest in that bunch that you cut off. So if you have a stacker, I'd probably encourage you to use it on this one because we're going to use these as the tail as well. So try and get your tips as even as you can. If you're not concerned about it, it is what it is. All right. So once we get all that prepped, we're going to tie this in and we're going to extend the tips past the end of our foam here on the pin, right on top, okay? So imagine how long the tail of the hex is. So you're probably looking at Looks like my first knuckle of my pinky to the tip of my finger, maybe a little bit longer than that. I'm just going to set it right up on top of that foam. And I'm going to come through with another loose wrap. And I'm going to apply slight pressure. Now right here you can see how that hair wants to flare, right? This is okay, we're going to, we're going to use this to our advantage. I'm going to come with one more loose wrap. Now I'm just going to pull the hairs to the sides a little bit more. When we're done, we're going to cut some of this out, but I want to make sure I have a nice like V splay to my tail when I'm done, right? And then once you get it where you're, where you like it, just kind of go back over it with maybe two or three. turns the thread with a little more pressure. All right, now is where we start getting into building our body on these pins. So each step is going to be wash, rinse, repeat. We're going to do the same thing. So in order to secure all of this, you want to grab your foam, kind of grab both sides like this, pull it back, and you want to lift that hair up as well Keep that thread locked in spindle up here. And you're just going to take your foam or your thread and advance it in front of your foam. You don't have to do a lot of turns, maybe two or three. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to make each segment just a little bit bigger as I move forward. So this first one is going to be a little bit smaller. Then once you advance your thread, you just come up. Go around the foam. I usually do about two or three turns. And then I'm going to pull that hair forward. And I'm going to do two more turns. And I'm going to pull the foam back, bring the hair up again, and advance my thread. Talking, I don't know, 15, 20 trips probably. I honestly tie a half a dozen. <laughs> That's it. As long as I don't lose them in a tree, I will run these things until they blow up. And I've caught hundreds of fish on one. They're pretty durable. I don't care if they're tattered and beat up. I think as that fly kind of gets beat up a little bit, it actually fishes a little bit better. You know, it kind of starts to take on a buggy appearance. Um, they do look cool when they're clean and new, but I think they, they start to fish better when 
they're beat up a little bit. Okay, so for my hex, I'm gonna do five segments. And then using my brown drakes, I'm doing three or four, three. And then my ISO, I only do two because I'm gonna add a couple more segments as I build up on the hook, right? My best overall um, all around size for the entire hatch. But I might run some that are bigger um, the first few days, and I might run some that are smaller towards the end. So, all right, so we got one segment done, and we're just gonna do four more here. So this next one's just gonna be a little bit bigger. A couple turns, pull your hair forward. And try and keep that hair on top as much as possible. And then we're going to pull everything back, advance the thread on the pin. We've got four basically tied now. The end result. I've got basically five tie-in points, right? So I just finished my fourth. I'm going to kind of finish this up right here. If you did one more, it's no big deal. We're just going to do like a two or three turn uh, if you're good at doing this with your hands, you can, uh, but I just use a whip finish tool. And I'm just going to come in and go one, two, call it good. And I'm going to put some pressure on that thread. And I don't really have a problem. I don't use glue or anything. I don't really have a problem with this blowing up. I'm pretty anti-glue when it comes to tying dries. Want to make sure it doesn't glue to your well, just trap and error, right? So, and it's adding weight. So, I'll show you a little trick here on pulling these out. They're done. I actually do tie with quite a bit of tension on the pin. I'm not sure if you guys are pushing the, pushing the thread tight on that or not, but. Guarantee you I'll break my thread at some point during this flight of mine, so don't feel bad. <laughs> Happens every time, especially when you put a hook point in the vise. Everybody there? Okay, so to pull this off, just pop this thread out. Don't cut that. We want this for later. So just leave that, and then I just kind of take it and just start to twist it a little bit, and then back it out. Eventually, it'll just let go. And you can kind of see, you know, the underside, it gets that nice segmented appearance. So we're done with the pin. So if you want to remove it, go ahead and just pop it out of your vise. And then you can take your thread and we'll put a little thread base on this hook real quick. Now I kind of stopped right about the point. I won't go back any further. I want to make sure I have enough of that bend exposed so that when a fish bites it, there's a gap for that hook to get a hold of the jaw. So now what you want to do, it's kind of like what we were doing with the pin. <clears throat> We're going to tie our foam on first. I'm going to try and make this segment just a little bigger than the previous one. Come in here with a loose wrap first. A little tension on it. And it, right here, if you kind of take the foam, you can kind of see I'm just kind of trying to wiggle that down on there. Let 
you have your thread that was attached, we're going to pull that forward. And we're going to pull that hair forward. So right here, if you look, when I pull on that hair, see how that tail kind of stands up? Right? I'm going to use this to my advantage to start to build that that curled taper in the tail. I'm going to pull it forward just a little bit when I go to tie it in. And then once we get that hair down, let's just pull this all back. Put a little tension on your thread, come forward in front of that foam a couple turns, and then I would pull it back fairly tight and just wrap up against that foam. All right, so here's that little thread trick. So if you pull on this gently, you'll feel it slide, right? Now there's two ways you can shape these bodies. What this is doing is at the end, the thread that you wrapped on your pin to get it started, it's going to pull all that through the body and kind of lock everything in together. If you don't do that, when you trim this back part out, you'll cut that thread and it could unravel from the rear. But that kind of locks it all. See how I pull on that and that tail moves? You can shape this bad boy. With any kind of curvature that you want, you want it more curled up, kind of hold it, put a little pressure, that'll help keep the tail up. If you want to curl the tail down a little bit, just kind of a little bit more of a normal mayfly pose, something like that, whatever your preference is. And then I just kind of lock it off with a few turns and then you can cut this excess out. We're done with it. All right, so if you start to look at how we have this spacing left on the hook, we need to get two more segments and a wing in between the two, okay? So we're gonna make our next tie-in point for the foam, maybe a little bit less than half the distance to the eye of this hook. So advance your thread a little bit. And if you pull your foam kind of down at an angle, when you go to make this next segment, it'll help kind of get the bottom to come around the hook shank. And then just come in with a couple loose turns and you can adjust the body. If you have a rotary vise, you can roll it over and look at it. Just make sure it's covering up that bottom a little bit. This is the part that makes it float good. And then once you get that segment in, pull the rest of this hair forward, tie it off, and then we're going to trim it out now. We don't need it anymore. Pull your foam back again, advance in front. I'm putting a little more pressure on this right now just to try and lock it in there a little more. So it should look something like this. I'm using a, a golden straw, grizzly dyed golden straw. You can kind of see that, it's like a yellowish color. And then I also have, this one says Cree, but there's no such thing as Cree. It's basically, do uh, you remember what the natural color is, Dylan? There's another name for it. Our ginger. 
What was it? Bar yeah, bar ginger. ginger. Yep. I believe that's what most of it's being marketed it is today. Is a bar ginger, but kind of looks like that. A feather that is fairly big. So I have a hackle gauge on my vise. And typically, when I go to tie any of my flies, I'll just size out a bunch of hackles ahead of time for how many I would need. I usually use two per fly. Um, but in this case, my gauge only goes to a four. So I want to make sure the majority of my fibers are at least that long. And you can probably go longer. It really isn't that big a deal. But if it's too short, you're not going to have a balanced fly. It's going to want to ride more on its side. So anytime you're working with two feathers, if you have a hackle gauge, this is the easiest way to pair them up. Just kind of go in, bend it, pull the feather towards you until you start to see the length of the hackle that you want, and then just strip it off at the base so you have some bare stem exposed, right? Do the same with the other one. And when you want to pair these up on the fly, it's pretty simple. You just match up the points where you strip the hackle off the stem. You're good to go. And if you don't have that hackle gauge, you can kind of put one feather on top of the other, pull the fibers back, and just kind of adjust with your eyesight and line them up. And I would leave, I don't know, a half inch of stem Maybe a little bit less. But what you can do, anytime working with two hackles, you can see already how my feathers are kind of rolling under the thread tension. Just do a couple of turns. And then if you grab the feathers and kind of get them going the same direction in your fingers, in your right hand and the left hand, and just slide it back and forth like this, it'll straighten the other one out. And then you can kind of lock it in. So you guys should have some white deer belly here. You should pull that out. So until you've tied a few of these, I would probably recommend you cut just a little bit more than you think you'll need. But I mean, that's a little bit plus a pencil in my fingers. Try and trim it as close to the base of the hide as you can. So you got as long a hair, deer hair in your hand as possible. All right, so you're gonna have a few really odd hairs that are just way longer. You can pull them out, don't need them. And then if you have a comb, it's a good idea to probably run it through this the butt sections real quick because you're going to have some under fur in there. Sometimes it's really hard to get out. If you don't, kind of really pinch the tips with your fingers and flatten it out a little bit and you can kind of flip it and you'll see stuff float away. And it just depends on the quality of the hair. This stuff looks like it's got a lot of different size tip so I'm just gonna go ahead and stack it real quick so after you do that you'll probably see some hairs that are really long probably pull those out and you'll probably see a few that are really short probably pull a few of those out and about the time you get done with that you'll have the right amount <laughs> so, so it should look something like that when you're done So we're gonna tie the nice clean tips towards the back, right? And I go just a little bit shorter than the tail, right about to the end of it. And we're just gonna come in, the loose wrap here, and another one. And it's okay to lift this flare if you need to, because that'll help to lock it in. And 
And I'm just gonna come in before I let go of everything and clean this up. And I'm just gonna kind of cover up this hair with some thread wraps real quick. Make sure it's really in there. So when you're done, you should have something that looks more like a stone fly. Or how many parachutes you tie. You may hear people talk about posting up your wing. Yeah. So what they're referring to is taking your wing and your hackle, bringing it vertical, and then you're just gonna run a couple of turns of thread around the base to kind of tie it all together. And then this will also create a base to turn your hackle on. But because it's such a big wing, I'm not gonna really try and create a big thread base for my hackle. But I do wanna kinda bring all that stuff together. So what is the end game? I don't know, but there's a study that came out of New Zealand that demonstrated there was a 70% 70 70 reduction in brown trout biomass in rivers affected by didymo. So the question is, does it have to have didymo every year? Um, in 15 years, you have four to eight bloom events and that's enough to create that disruption? I don't know, nobody knows. But I'm here to tell you it impacted the fishing right now. It was, not what it was last year. And I've been noticing a slow change over time, especially in the Lord River. I just could never put a finger on it. What's going on here? But the number one thing that has changed is the declining habitat has expediated its process. It's speeding up. The last five years, we've lost a lot more deep water habitat faster. And we've also had a lot of trees die, right? Right. old ash borer, other disease. So now you have more sun hit the water. The river can't deal with that solar intensity anymore. It's warming up too soon. We lost two degrees of water temp between 72 and CCC Bridge this year during June. It became uniform. Last year, I still had, if it was 72 at CCC, it was 70 at 72. This year, if it was 72 at CCC, it was more than likely 72 at um, M72 as well. Right. You know, it's nice having those gauges now. I can kind of see what's going on. But last year I could go upstream and find cold water refuge. Now I really got to go upstream to find cold water refuge. And it's still, it's getting harder. Correct. Shade would, you know, some planting trees, putting, you know, strategic, not just willy nilly putting wood in the river, but strategically approaching it. And you have to start upstream in the headwaters and you have to work your way down. It's going to be expansive, exhaustive, and expensive. But if you want streams that are going to be viable and not sterile ditches, which is where we're heading, you're going to have to do something like this. I think it's going to be more of a hands-off approach, and it's going to be up to us to be responsible, right? To be responsible in our own movements and uh, washing our gear. And, um, That's not a great strategy. No. If you saw what was going on on the Manistee this spring, no, it's not, it's not too it's not strange. Strange at all. Yeah. So, and this is all under the assumption that it's, you know, an invasive species. What if it's not? What if it's a native nuisance and it's always been here? So now the habitat element becomes even more critical. If it's already in all our streams right. and it's just a habitat and low phosphorus issue, well, we've hit the low phosphorus layer. Now it's, here comes the rest, right? So the only, and it's not gonna be a fix, but the only way I think you can slow down Didymo's ability to take over any of our streams is having good quality habitat. And that's variable habitat, not uniform, like what we're starting to see. There's a lot of, you know, riffle run pool complex, you hear about that all the time, right? The Manistee is a run, 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 run complex. <laughs> Oh, there's a pool. Run, 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 run. Right. It's got some systemic issues that need to be corrected. 
tight end. So we got this foam. We want to make one more segment. So advance your, your thread just short of the eye of the hook. And we're going to pull it down again towards the bottom. And you want to leave a little bit of space. Don't go tight to the eye. Kind of come behind it a little bit. So I'm probably looking at, I don't know, eighth of an inch gap. Let me get a turn or two in here and I'll show you. So when I go to secure my foam, I'm not going to wrap towards my eye. I'm going to wrap towards the wing, right? I want to build a little bit and kind of see the, the hook eye is not buried in that foam. And so when I go to tie it off, I want to wrap back towards the wing more so than towards the eye. And I'm going to pull all this foam forward again, come in front with a couple tight turns. Okay. If you look at it, you should have a little bit of a gap in there. So here's, here's another little trick to kind of make this a little easier to tie off and finish. When you go to cut your foam, put some tension in it. Come in tight with your scissors just by the tips. Snip it. You can kind of see how it doesn't leave a lot of excess foam in there. Come to the other side, do the same thing. I'm not going to really worry about cleaning it up unless I have a lot of big chunks. Because I want to make sure that this does not slip. So I'm going to take my thread and cover this area up a little bit. Feathers are going to want to go in one direction. You can't force it, right? So I can tell right now that I'm going to have to come down with mine in order to get it to flatten out. So you can see how the shiny side is up, right? If I just start turning it, it wants to roll itself over and upside down. So I have to kind of follow that path that Feather wants to take to start this fly. So I'm going to lift the wing up, kind of bounce it around. I want to get to the front edge of that wing. And once I get there, if everything is lined up, like you can see how my hackle is basically lined up perfectly, right? Shiny side up. Now I'm just going to come in. I'm going to wrap that bare post around two times. I'm going to come up with two or three turns here. And then I'm going to grab this wing and I'm going to Gently pull on that hackle and apply a little tension. And what it's doing is it's allowing all those little fibers to kind of flare, flare out, right? Mm -hmm. So once I do that, then I'm just going to bounce this thing back through for a turn or two to get back to the base of my wing. Oops. And then I'll tie it off. So what I'm going to do right here is I've got my thread in one hand, my hackle in the other, and I'm going to take my thread over top of those hackle tips and just kind of pin it right near the eye of that hook. And then I'm going to lift everything up, make a turn, a thread or two, and I'm going to do that one more time. So what you should see is, see how these hackle tips are kind of flared off at a 45? That should be locked in there pretty good. So once you get that done, we can go ahead and whip finish the thread and remove that. Now it's just a matter of trimming everything up. So now you can kind of come in here and trim out your hackle tips. And what I'll do is just kind of roll my vise around. Just look for any really weird hackles that are wanting to point straight down if you have any. If not, you did, you did an awesome job. Congrats. <laughs> So 
So now you can pretty much call it good if you wanted to. Um, so my original pattern, I used tan or a cream colored foam. And what I'll do with all of mine that I'm fishing and tying personally is I'll take a yellow marker and a brown marker and then I'll just kind of lightly brush up the body. And it kind of gives it more of a realistic appearance in my opinion. This is not a necessary step, but I find that it adds a lot more to the appearance of the fly. So I'm just gonna take that straight down on the bottom, on the tail, run it along the side. I'm not trying to cover it in yellow. And then once that's done, I'll take my brown and just kind of lightly brush the bottom as well. And then maybe a few little dots on the sides here. And then you just push the heck right down. Yep. Yeah. Run them till they pop. And when that's done, if you look at it, it's kind of got a pretty realistic look. That's it. See all day done.